You're listening to Science Friday from NPR News. I'm, I'm Ira Flato here at Arizona State University talking, with, uh, talking about physics, cosmology, particle physics, all kinds of stuff. Uh, gotten into interesting side trips. And uh, I mentioned before, I couldn't think, I had a senior moment, I couldn't think of the name of the person I was trying to think of before. It was John Wheeler, uh, who, who had mentioned that uh, his idea was that the reason uh, the universe exists is because we are here to observe it. So they need the process of observation to, to to create the objects in, quantum, in the quantum world. Also with, also with me is Lawrence Krauss of Arizona State University, Michael Turner, University of Chicago, Brian Green at Columbia, of Columbia University, also who is head of the, uh, the Science Festival in New York. It's happening this year, Brian? What? Yeah, June, June 10th to June 14th, the World Science Festival. World yep. Science Festival is great. Also, Stephen Weinberg, professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Texas at Austin and winner of the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, Stephen, was I right about John Wheeler? You come in, another fellow Texan. I know you came like, to Texas pretty late there, but... Yeah, well, uh, he, uh, he... Yes, you were right about uh, his views, but his views were very different from those of uh, most astronomers and physicists today. John really thought that uh, things have to ex the only things that can exist are things that we observe, and the, they exist so that we can observe them. Uh, I remember he had an argument, the universe will live forever. It has to be eternal, because otherwise there wouldn't be time for us to observe everything. Now, John was a great f physicist, and he was my professor at Princeton, but I think that was sort of crazy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, most of us take a very different point of view. Uh, for us, the, this whole anthropic business only makes sense if uh, what we call the universe, uh, the Big Bang, uh, the galaxies expanding, out to billions of light years in all directions is just one part of a much larger multiverse mm -hmm. and uh, in which the different parts have different values for constants of nature like the dark energy. Uh, then the anthropic idea just becomes common sense. It's just like um, trying to understand why water is liquid on the surface of the Earth. If the Earth was the only planet in the universe, then, you, then it really would be amazing that we're just the right distance from the sun to uh, make water liquid and hence life to be possible. And John Wheeler might say, well, it has to be that or else we wouldn't be here. But most of us would feel that that, you know, that was kind of theological. On the other hand, if there are countless planets, which we now know there are, uh, then, and many of them are not close, are, are either too far from their planet for water to be liquid or too close to it. You mean their sun? There's yeah, sun. I mean, excuse yeah. me, from, right. from their, their respective stars. Right. In that case, uh, it's natural that we are, are on the one of the minority of planets which are at the right distance from their star. It's just common sense that yeah. that's where we would be. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing in the formation of planets that has anything to do with us. And it's not, it's also, and Steve got mentioned something very important, it's not theological. A lot of people think that somehow the anthropic principle suggests the universe is fine-tuned so we could exist, and that's evidence for, but it's exactly the opposite. It's just like evolution. It's, you know, why does a bee so fine-tuned to be able to see the flowers? Because if it wasn't, it wouldn't survive. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's cosmic evolution. Yeah, mm -hmm. but John Wheeler probably did think it was fine-tuned. Yeah, yeah, he did, I think, and that's why... We disagree. Speaking of fine-tuning, Michael, did you have... Though some of us chafe at using the word anthropic and common sense in the same sentence. I can, see, and, uh, I can, I can see that. When we have so much uh, in front of us to try to understand about the universe. I mean, if you, the metaphor for cosmology right now is that we know a tremendous amount about the universe and we understand a lot less. And mm -hmm. so uh, some of us feel like we ought to concentrate our, on our own universe before we uh, imagine a multiverse. Well, let's go to our own universe. And the question are right here in the front row. Yes. Um, you guys briefly mentioned the importance of public understanding of the value of scientific discovery, the idea that a non-finding can be equally as important, if not more important, than a tangible discovery. Um, this is something that's clearly important to you gentlemen because you're participating in a public forum. How do you feel that academics in general are addressing this issue in terms of funding and also in terms of just increasing public understanding of science? Can you be more specific and give us an example of what you're talking about? Um, 
Well, specifically, you guys were talking about the Hadron Collider, right. and you can read in scientific articles that people think that, you pe that scientists uh, in general will be creating a black hole and kill us all, um, mm -hmm. and that this is not good for anybody. Um, well, we all hate it when that yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's an awful day. So how do, how do physicists in general address this question that I think has, it, it has its roots in public, um, mm -hmm. the public not understanding what you physicists are doing in general. You, you really hit a really important point that I think the scientific community is partly responsible for. We tend to sometimes hype things too much. And we have to beware. Uh, you know, we, we, we've got to be careful about saying what is likely to happen. And we want to promote things. After all, the Large Hadron Collider costs a lot of money. And we're trying to convince people to spend money to do something. And we often like to say it's going to recreate the early universe. It's going to, and, 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 and sometimes that comes back to bite us. I think it's very important that scientists uh, try, of course, get people interested in what we're doing, but not overhype the situation because it, it's always bad. And in fact, as it's exactly that. If we say we're guaranteed to discover all these new particles, the Large Hadron Collider, and we see nothing, then how can we come back later and say, you know, that was what we really wanted? Although, okay. I mean, I'll just add one thing to that. I don't think it was by design, but this notion of creating a black hole that could eat up Geneva and the rest of the world was perhaps the greatest PR ploy that one could ever have imagined for the Large Hadron Collider. I can't tell you the number of television and radio shows I did where they ostensibly said they wanted to talk about the physics of the Large Hadron Collider. The only reason they had me there was to discuss black holes eating up the Earth. And it was actually a wonderful opportunity to then jump off from that and talk about the real science and how exciting it is. But getting back to your question more generally, I think there was a time when there was a resistance on the part of the scientific academic community to be out there talking about our ideas in a public setting. When I was writing my first book, there was definitely a fear that I don't know how my colleagues are going to respond to this. But I was really pleasantly surprised. There was great support among the people who, at least to my face, there, 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 there was great support. Um, and, and I really get a sense from doing this World Science Festival and other activities that there's a, a willingness and, and even an enthusiasm on the part of so many scientists to try to get the real message of science out there. So I, I think things are going in the right direction. And, and I should say that, uh, you know, for programs like this, there's some perception of, of some people in the media that people aren't interested in science, but lots of people listen to this program. And we, did, we had an event associated with this meeting yesterday at a, at a high school, a thousand high teenagers spent two, two hours in the afternoon, and there was no basketball players there. Was, there was, you know, three physicists, and it was, it, was, uh, it was really gratifying. I think the public really is interested, and, and, and probably the people we have to convince the most maybe are some of the media people, because uh, I think the public is fascinated by what's going on at the forefront of science. Yeah, we have 12 million downloads of our podcast, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty... You give them the opportunity, they'll, they'll, they'll listen as much this as they can. An, this is an old story when Galileo wrote his dialogue concerning the two chief systems of the world in which he presented his uh, discoveries about astronomy. He uh, wrote it in Italian rather than in Latin. Latin was the language that would reach scholars throughout Europe, and uh, Italian was a language that would be read by ordinary people, and um, he wanted it to be read by ordinary people. Unfortunately, it got him into some trouble. But uh, mm. we, we don't face that problem, at least. Well, while we have a large audience here, Brian, let me ask you about string theory and what, what you think is happening with it. It's been many decades now old. Are you still as confident in it as, as you've always been? or what, what, well, I, uh, About answering the, sure. the everything? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think it's, it's worth just clarifying what confidence means. I'm often asked, do you still believe in string theory? And I'm glad you didn't frame it that way, because mm -hmm. my response to that question would have been, I don't believe in anything until it's experimentally proven. I have confidence that this is the best approach currently on the table mm -hmm. for answering this deep question of putting together Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, and quantum physics. If there were a better theory on the table, I, and I'm sure all other string theorists would turn their attention toward it. It is the best thing we have. And over the last few decades, the math has come together in such an incredibly compelling way. The pieces have locked together in a way where as you work on it, you feel this has to be leading me toward a true, deeper understanding of the world. But that is not how you judge a theory. You judge it whether mm -hmm. it makes predictions that are going to be confirmed by experiment. And we are working hard in that direction. And so, yes. 
I, I, I would suspect Lawrence may want Yeah, to Brian and I have talked about this uh, publicly in the past, but um, there, yeah, it's been, I think, however, unfortunately, the direction is, has demonstrated that it's, it's, it's less and less likely to be able to predict any, anything. In fact, instead of a theory of everything, it'd be a theory of anything, in the sense that, that right now it looks like um, that it predicts a multitude of possible universes in which almost anything can happen. And, and science is sort of based on falsifiability. And, and if you can predict anything, then you really predict nothing. And so it, it, it is still promising, although I see my, my friend Frank Wilczek in the audience, and as he says, it's, it's been promising and promising and promising. So we'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you want to get a rebuttal in, Brian? There? Well, the only thing that I would say to that is, you know, when you're trying to answer questions that are this deep, questions that in one form or another we've been asking for thousands of years, questions that could indeed lead to resolutions of how the universe began, where it all came from, the origin of time, mm -hmm. these are big issues. And if you're working on a theory for a few decades and it matures in various unexpected ways, you go with it and you try ultimately to extract